Lord. So I'm thankful Mississippi was probably close to the first state that come on board and said, uh, we're, we're banning them. We're shutting them down this very minute. And so it has been. And so I rejoice in that. Uh, today, another sign that Christ is still on the throne, folks. And so uh, just keep praying, keep serving Jesus. Our redemption is drawing nigh. Yeah. And so uh, take your Bibles, turn to the book of Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 1. And we'll begin reading in verse number 4. And we'll go through the end of chapter 1. And uh, this, this, this portion of Scripture was a, a challenge to me because so much of the Old Testament was quoted. Um, I believe it's seven Old Testament references are mentioned in these uh, 11, 12 verses here. But in verse number 4 of chapter number 1, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance attained a more excellent name than they. For under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. You get what he's saying? How many of the angels did God the Father look at and invite them to be the son of God? Yeah, none. Verse 6, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let the angels of God worship him. Amen. And the angel, and of the angels, he said, Who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But under, sun, under the sun, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. Look at verse 11. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to the which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? I find this strange that here at the front door of the book of Hebrews that he comes as we looked at last week. We looked at the superiority of Christ that how Christ was better than the prophets. The prophets had a temporary word but Jesus is the final word. And he closed the canon and now we have a completed Bible. And so thanks be to God I don't have to wait for some prophet to come up and say well I've got a word from God. Well, yeah if you got a word from God today you got it from the book. Not from a vision, not from a dream. No, you got it from the Word of God. And so today he comes in and now he's focusing in magnifying Christ above the angels. And as I studied and analyzed this and wrapped my brain around it, I wonder why would the author of Hebrews spend 12 verses magnifying Christ above angels. And then as I began to dig and study, I found out that in, there's a, there was this section of Jews that thought angels was either on the same level of Jesus or the angels were superior to Jesus. That was a belief in the Hebrew world. So now I understand why he spends 12 verses magnifying Christ over the angels. The Jews had a fascination with angels. 
And say, well, that don't mean much for us today. Oh, yes, it does because America is fascinated with angels. Fixing to pop some bubbles. When you die, you don't get wings. Amen. Amen. When you die, you don't become angels. You are the bride of Christ if you're born again. You don't grow wings and fly. The angels come get you and take you to Jesus. So, in America, anytime somebody dies, so and so got their wings today. No, I'm sorry. They didn't get no wings. They're not angels. And so we, we need to understand this because even here in America, it seems like we put angels almost on the same level with Jesus. And that's idolatry. And that breaks the first commandment. And so we need to understand these things about this fascination with angels. I'll give you this as I found in my study that there's 105 references 105 references in the Old Testament concerning angels. And in the New Testament, there's 165 re scriptural references to angels in the New Testament. So 270 times throughout our Bible, we have references to angels. So we need to know about angels. And He gives us the clear purpose of these angels, who they are in relation to who Christ is. And so angels were created... Angels are servants, and angels worship and serve before the throne. But Christ, He was not created, He was begotten. He existed before He was ever born. You and me did not exist before our birth. Therefore, we are the creature, and He is the Creator. So Christ was begotten, the angels were created. Christ is sovereign, whereas the angels serve the sovereign. Christ rules and reigns on the throne, whereas the angels rejoice and worship before the throne. Amen. Angels are under King Jesus. And so we, we need to understand these things. But here in this passage, there's seven Old Testament passages that show us that Christ is superior to the angels. And I want to give you these, and if you're keeping notes, you can jot them down. But in Hebrews 1 verse 5, he quotes Psalm chapter 2 verse 7. In Hebrews 1 5, he quotes Psalm 2 verse 7 and 2 Samuel 7 14. And this has to do with Christ's sonship. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 6, he quotes Psalm 97 7. Hebrews 1 6, he quotes Psalm 97 7. And this refers to Christ's first coming. In Hebrews 1.7, Hebrews 1.7, he quotes Psalm 104.4, and it refers to Christ's rule over angels. Psalm 107 quotes Psalm 104.4, and it refers to Christ's rule over angels. Hebrews 1.8, he quotes Psalm 45, verse 6 and 7. Hebrews 1.8, he quotes Psalm 45, verse 6 and 7, and it refers to Christ's exaltation. Hebrews 1.9, he quotes Isaiah 63. Hebrews 1.9, he quotes Isaiah 63, verse 1 through 3, and this deals with Christ's anointing while here on earth. In Hebrews 1.10, he quotes Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27, and he speaks of Christ's eternality. Hebrews 1.10, he quotes Psalm 102, verse 25 through 27. And finally, in Hebrews 1.13, he quotes Psalm 110.1, and it refers to Christ's sovereignty over all. So what do you talk, why, why do you spend time here, Brother Daniel, in telling me of all these seven Old Testament passages he brings in? Because the Jews only have an Old Testament and Paul's telling them, I'm not teaching y'all nothing y'all don't already know. I'm not teaching nothing that's already new. I'm just telling you what you're already supposed to know. <laughs> Uh-oh. So why were they so confused about it? Well, they just misread or misinterpreted the Scripture. So how is Christ then greater than the angels? Well, there's three reasons there's more than three reasons, but there's three main reasons I want to give you. In verse 4 and 5, verse 4 tells it for us. 
Christ is better than the angels because of His excellent name. Look in verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So you see that. Christ has a more excellent name than they. Verse 5. For unto you which of the angels said He at any time, Thou art my Son, this day I have begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. You get the idea. Christ is it. He's been given the name above every name. And he's never looked at an angel at any time and said, Thou art my son, I begotten thee, and I'll be a father. God has never said that to an angel. As you journey through your Bible, you'll find that angels desire to look into the things that we have received of Christ. They don't know what it is to be redeemed. Angels are sinless creatures, at least those that hadn't fallen. There was a third of the angels that fell with Lucifer, but the rest that stayed and remained a two-thirds, they remained without sin. So they're sinless beings. So it's almost like angels are almost above humans until the point they get redeemed and we being redeemed because we're joined as with Christ. Yeah. Woo! Glory to God. There's, there's a song in heaven the angels can't sing that's made just for the redeemed. Yeah. And when we get there, we're going to sing a new song which the angels in heaven don't know. What a wonderful blessing that is. Christ has been given an excellent name. So, I do know that there are at least three angels that's named in Scripture. Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. There may be more, but that's what I know. That's what I know. So Michael, when, when Michael appears in Scripture, he's known for his mightiness. He's a mighty angel. He was contending with the devil with the body of Moses in the book of Jude. So... So Michael's sort of like this military style angel. He's doing God's bidding. Uh, he's going to war with the evil forces of this world. And aren't you glad for the unknown and the unseen spiritual realm? God has servants called angels uh, who are at His beck and call. Uh, who, are, who are watching over us. Who are aiding Christ and keeping us to those that will be the heirs of salvation. Then there's this mention of Gabriel. Gabriel is the messenger angel. Every time you see Gabriel, he's got a message. It was Gabriel when the Savior became flesh and was born in Bethlehem's manger. It was Gabriel that appeared and says, For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It is Gabriel that appeared to Mary and Joseph and said, Joseph, don't put her away. That thing which is conceived in her is conceived by the Holy Ghost. She's been faithful to you, old Joseph. Don't put her away. You're going to be the stepfather to the Son of God. Yeah, and it was Gabriel and others Angels that appeared on His resurrection. So they not only announced His birth, they <laughs> assured of His resurrection. The one, I, why seek ye among the living, the angel did say. <laughs> he said you came looking for Him, but He ain't here. He is risen. Amen. And that's about all you hear about angels in the New Testament until you get to the book of Acts. In Acts 28, 27, Paul on the ship. And he says, boys, we don't need to go because if we're going to go, we're going down. And when things was a rough and a rocking and things was looking bad, down in about, uh, about midway to 27, Paul said this night, the angel of the Lord he came and stood by me and said, ain't nobody going to lose their life. Everything's going to be all right. Amen. I'm glad, hallelujah, that we have the Word of God that revealed to us these things. 
Now, since the canon's closed, I, I don't believe angels has got another message because Christ is the final message. The canon of Scripture's been closed. There's nothing more to add and there's certainly nothing to take away from the precious book. But Michael is known for his mighty ministry. Gabriel is known for his being a messenger. His ministry of sounding forth, declaring... And then you have Lucifer. He's a bad angel. But it's Lucifer didn't start out bad. You know that Lucifer was the highest cherubim. A cherubim, there's different degrees of angels. And Lucifer was the cherubim angel. Not a, just a cherubim. Those are the cherubims you find in Isaiah 6. They had six wings. Two, they covered their eyes, uh, their face. And two, they covered their feet. And with two wings, they flew. And they were crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You know what Satan's position was in heaven? He was the worship leader in heaven. He designated all the angels. He was in, in, in charge of worship. Now isn't it wonder since He come to this earth, He has corrupted and distorted what real worship is. Because He wants to be worshipped. He wanted to be God. And that's why He was cast out of heaven. You can read it in Isaiah 14. You'll find where Lucifer fell from heaven. And a third of the angels went with him. What I'm telling you, friend, is Satan made a choice that he, he, he was so high up in the ranks of angels that he wanted to be God. He was jealous of the worship they were giving to him. And isn't that what he offered Jesus when he was in the wilderness and he was tempted of Satan 40 days? If you'll just worship me, I'll give you all this. Empty vain promises. The Satan is still at large in charge and doing that today. If you'll just worship me, I'll give you this. I'll give you this. But let me just tell you, the devil always pays in counterfeit money. He never comes through on his end of the deal. Jesus always does. So we, we think of this more excellent name as, as high as Lucifer was. He failed because of pride. He wanted to be God and that's what he convinced Adam and Eve. Well, Eve really in the garden. If you'll eat that fruit, you'll be like God. I want you to be fallen like I am, Eve. And she took it. And that put us all in the fall. That put us all in need of a Savior. But I'm glad when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made under the woman, made under the law, to redeem us who were under the law, that we could be forgiven and set free to sinners far and wide, who, 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 whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they're high class, middle class, low class, no class, they could come to Christ by faith and be saved. This excellent name, we, we find this so much being said in the book of Philippians that let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself even the death of the cross wherefore God had highly exalted him and giving Him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory be to God the Father. Do you get the idea? Jesus come. He set aside His heavenly privileges. He laid aside the glory that He had with the Father before the world was. He came and went to the cross as a man, as the God man to redeem you from your sins. And doing that, He humbled Himself. He emptied Himself, not of His deity, but He emptied Himself of the privileges that He had. You know He could have called 12 legions of angels. Not 10,000. Songwriters need to get a Bible. It's not 10,000 angels. It's 12 legions. What's the big whoop about that? Y'all know how many's in a legion? Five to 6,000. 
Jesus had anywhere from 60 to 72,000 angels on standby waiting for him to give him the word to come get him off the cross. Why didn't he call? His love for humanity was greater than the suffering he was enduring. He bore it all. He bore our sins up in his own body that we could be set free. He, he's been given the name which is above every name. And let me just go ahead and tell you whether in this life or the life to come, you will bow. And you will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory be to God the Father. And my way of thinking is, why not do it now and get the benefits of eternal life and fellowship with the Son uh, and enjoy Jesus here uh, so you can really enjoy Him there. You know that even the devil himself has got to bow. And he's going to have to confess Jesus is Lord just to be thrown in the pit. So will sinners in this life that refuse to bow the knee and bow the heart before God and call upon Christ for them to be saved. Christ has been given this excellent name. This name which exceeds His name. But you know there's one thing that's greater than the name. Psalm 138 says He's magnified His Word above His name. He's magnified His Word above His name. How else are you going to know about this Jesus if you do not have the Word? You can. You see, the Lord in this excellent name, He's not just merely mighty like Michael. He is the Almighty. And with Gabriel, he's not just a messenger. He is the message. And as Lucifer was in heaven, this, this great star, he's called the morning star in Isaiah 14. Star of the morning is what he's called. But with Jesus, he's not the star. He's the sun. He's the one that gives the light because when you get to glory, friend, there'll be no night because the Lamb is the light and there'll never be darkness in glory. Amen. This excellent name. You see how God has just brought this up that He's just magnified. He says, oh yes, this is what the angels are good at. This is what makes the angels great. He says, but my son's better. My son's better. So this brings us to verse 6 and 7, which I would call the second main point that I want to make today is that His exceeding fame. Not only His excellent name, but His exceeding fame. He's more famous than the angels. Jesus gets way more page space than the angels do. Way more. So let's dive into this in verse number 6. Listen to what it says. And again, when He bringeth in the first begotten into the world, He saith... And let the angels of God worship Him. And they did. When Jesus came into this world, He was despised and re rejected of man, but He was received and the angels rejoiced at His birth. In verse 7, He says, And of the angels, He said, Who maketh His angels spirits and His ministers a flame of fire. The angels worshipped Him as Jesus stepped out of eternity into time and being born as a virgin-born baby. There was no room for Him in the inn and He was laid in that manger, that food trough and that barn on the side of the inn. See, Jesus enjoyed all the glories of heaven and He came to this old gloomy world to redeem whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord. The reality is in our day they don't accept the fact that Jesus came. The Jews are still looking for their Messiah to come the first time. They believe Jesus was a mere prophet. 
This to me is enough evidence to convict them and condemn them already. He's come. The angels done it. They rejoiced. They announced it. They were there. Just like the scripture said he was. But they worship him now as he's seated upon the throne after making sacrifice for sin once. They are day and night around the throne going, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The angels will worship Him again when He comes again. Matter of fact, one of the angels is going to have... The angels ain't done with their message. They're going, they got one more message. And the Lord shall descend out of heaven with a shout accompanied by the voice of the archangel. Woo. And the trump of God. And we're out of here. One more message for the angels. In our lifetime. Maybe. If it comes in this lifetime. But if not, we're still going to hear the angel talk. Of Jesus shouting coming down. Amen. And I believe the church is going to shout going up. Amen. Oh, what a day. Glorious day that's going to be. We understand where he's getting at this fame of Jesus. As famous as the angels are known for what they've done, Christ far exceeds what they have accomplished. Verse 7 tells us uh, here in verse 7, And of the angels, he said, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers flame of fire. We've alluded to this, that there's two, maybe three kinds of angels. There's like Michael, he's, he's mighty, he's known for his military. And then there's messenger and ministering angels. Uh, those like Gabriel that's got the message. But there are unknown angels. When Jesus was tempted 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness of Satan in uh, Matthew chapter what, 3, 4? Matthew 4? At the end of that temptation you find the angels ministering to Jesus. Well, I'm glad, thank God, that these angels are ministering spirits that help God's people. See, these ministering angels, they came to Peter, they came to Paul, they came to others. They even came to little children in the wilderness in the book of Genesis. They came to Christ in the wilderness, and they came to God's people in their time of need. They came to Paul in a very frightening time in his life. And he comes to those who are heirs. Salvation. Any of you had any trauma in your life? Near-death experiences? You know, I'm almost hesitant to even talk about this. They'll call me a fanatic. They'll call me crazy. I could care less what people say. When I was 14 years old, I got up on that day like I did every day on the weekend. And it was pretty outside. It was summertime. I didn't have to go to work. Hallelujah for that. Fourteen and working. Yes, I was a bad boy at Piggly Wiggly. But I got to get up and I went to ride my four-wheeler. That morning, I was, I'm, I'm lost at fourteen. Okay, I'm lost as a ball and tall weed. Tail is my home. I get up and I walk past the extra bedroom. And there's a rack in there that's got my helmet on it. I don't need that thing. And I walk past it. And I vaguely remember turning back, going in, getting that helmet and putting it on. Forty-five minutes later, I, I don't remember nothing else. I wake up and I'm at the med in Memphis. And I'm talking out of my mind up to this point. And everybody that was in that room said, when my eyes opened, I came to them. They said, my first words, did you see the angel? You take it however you want to. God could have let me die. Mm -hmm. And He could have let me go. But He didn't. I don't remember it. I can't tell you nothing about that accident. I don't know nothing about it. But they said the very first words I said. 
and then down see the angels. Ain't nothing special about me. I'm just an old sinner like you. But I sure am glad God had an angel with me that day. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be saved. I wouldn't get to be married to a wonderful wife. Sure wouldn't get to have the privilege of being a, a daddy and a little girl. What are you saying? God's given to us whether we realize it or not. These things that come our way, whether it's a flat tire, dead battery, it could be an angel watching out for you. We do have guardians. But they only do what Christ said. They're not freelancing. They go to who God says go to. <laughs> but I don't give the angels the credit for saving me or keeping me safe. You know who calls that? Jesus. We're living in days where people will worship these angels and that. Friend, that, you, you remember in the book of Revelation when John was on Patmos and this angel appeared and he bowed down to work. He said, oh no, no, don't you worship me. We're fellow servants together. We worship Him. Get up, John! Don't worship me. The exceeding fame of Jesus. You understand? He's the great I Am. He's higher than the highest. He's greater than the greatest. He is the one that's all together lovely. He's the lily of the valley. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the bright morning star. He's the balm of Gilead. Hallelujah. He's the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. He's the savior of the world, friend. He is the friend that's sticking closer than a brother. I can't exalt him enough. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Jesus is it. If you have Jesus, you have everything. And if you don't have Jesus, friend, you ain't got nothing. Lastly, verses 8 through 14, he, he magnifies this exceptional claim. Look in verse number 8. But under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall never fail. We just stop reading right there as we'll, we'll come back to verse 13 and 14 in just a moment. But there, there's three things I want you to see. This is the whole thrust of it. This is the main body. And, and it's pretty self-explanatory. This exceptional claim that Christ had, He's Jesus, the Son of God. It's what our text calls Him. And so when, I, when we see this, His claim to be, He magnifies His person, who He is. He's not just an angel. He's the Son of God. And as you see in verse number 8, the first thing He says, but unto the Son, capital S, little O, little N. He's speaking of Jesus there. You see that? When it's a little S, it's always referring to believers. But it's when it's capital S for Son, He's always speaking of Christ. So it's but unto Jesus, He saith, and the first thing He mentions is thy throne. You see something of His sovereignty. I'm glad I serve a sovereign God. What does that even mean? It means ain't nobody controlling God. God's doing what He wants to, when He wants to, how He wants to, because He's God. Man is not going to stop God. Man can't thwart God's purposes and God's plan. God ain't sitting up there wondering what He's going to have to do next. Everything is going according to schedule. They mean it for evil, but God's working it for good. <laughs> Woo! We can say like Joseph, y'all meant it for evil, but He, God, meant it for good. God's going to 
turn this thing around. And we can quote uh, Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called, the called according to His purpose. So we serve a sovereign God. He's the one on the throne. And it says, notice the next phrase, O God, is thy throne, O God. Another reference to sovereignty. How long is it? Forever and ever. We see something else about Christ. Not only His sovereignty, but His eternality. You understand? There'll never be a time God does not exist. There never has been, nor will there ever be. When everything we see is gone, there'll be Jesus. And by the way, heaven and earth is going to pass away. But Jesus in His Word, He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth one day. And that holy city, New Jerusalem, is going to come out of heaven (laughs) as a bride adorned for her husband. He's going to sit on the throne of David and rule and reign. What a wonderful Savior. Not only that, He calls it this scepter of righteousness. Uh, is the scepter of thy kingdom. This, uh, this word for scepter has the idea of one that has authority. Do you know that all power in heaven and earth has been given unto Christ? Christ is it. He's the authority figure. What Jesus says goes. Jesus answers to nobody and to no one. Move a little bit further down through. He calls it the scepter of righteousness. We see something of His integrity. And then He says He's above thy fellows. We see His superiority. There's nobody like Jesus. We make a mock of God when we try to compare something of this world to Jesus. It can't be done. Isaiah's clear. Who is likened unto me? What is likened unto me? There's nothing you can compare to me. He's head and shoulders of everything else. He's in a class all by himself. That's who Jesus is. Then he relates to his power in verses 10, 11, and 12. Listen to what he says in verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the works of thine hands. You understand, this is a direct quotation. Verse 10, 11, and 12 is Psalm 102, verse 25 through 28. And what you need to know, that Christ has the power to create. He laid the foundation of the earth, and what did He say? The heavens are the works of His hands. Matter of fact, one of the Psalms says, a work of His finger. And I looked that up. That was pretty interesting. I believe it's Psalm 8. Talks about the work of God's finger in heaven. And as I looked up what that means, it means a small, unnoticeable move of the finger. He made the heaven. Either he moved it so fast you couldn't tell it, or it was so. Little effort, it wasn't even a twitch, it was an unnoticeable movement of the finger. All of heaven was great. Wow. Is that your God today? The God who can do exceeding abundantly above all that we can think or ask according to the power that worketh in us? He's got the power to create in verse 11 and 12. Mainly verse 12, notice what it says, And a vesture shalt thou fold them up. And they shall be changed. He's talking about how the the world and the heavens are going to perish. But thou remainest the same. He says they're going to wax old as just a garment. They're going to fold up. They shall be changed. Let me tell you something. God's got the power to change. He's got the power to change hearts. He's got the power to change lives. He's got the power to change circumstances. And all you've got to do, you come to Christ. Wanting Christ. Not what He can do for you, but you really want Christ. And it won't matter what Christ does, because you'll have Christ. That, that's the whole key. He's got the power to change. Do you know something? I'm mindful that after this week, that Roe versus Wade was not a political win. It's a spiritual win. 
A lot of people's bragging about Trump getting this done. God, uh, Trump didn't get it done. Just because he went in office and because we got Republicans that has some morality about them. A man didn't do what has happened this week. You know why I saw him? I mean, Proverbs 21.1 says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Amen. And as the waters channel through the book, so, so turneth the, the king's heart whithersoever he will. Yeah. Right. Hmm? That's how sovereign our God is. Oh, all them prayers had been prayed in vain. Right. All that witnessing we've done and all that telling folks about how we're going, it's not. And I says, okay, we just found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. When everything else is going to pot, he says, yeah. I believe I can turn the direction of this thing. Yeah. And shoo, and by the way, I think it started something because they said they're not stopping here. They're going after same-sex marriage names. Amen. Who does that? God. Quit bragging on Trump and start bragging on Jesus. Amen. <laughs> now, look in verse 13 and 14. We, we see something here about his position. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, even until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now what does this author do? How many angels did God look to and invite the angels to sit down in Jesus' seat and say, Sit here till I make all your enemies thy footstool? Well, the answer is none. This is how much superior Jesus is than them. Jesus is the only one that can sit on that throne because He done what nobody else could do. And He's the only qualified one. And He sat down because He's defeated all the enemies through His life, sinless life, His sacrificial death, His supernatural resurrection, <laughs> His sure ascension. Woo. And He's accomplished it all. And if you want Him, you can have Him. If you'll come. Verse 14, and I'm done. He's speaking of angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? I'm glad... That our Lord knows the end from the beginning. I'm glad He knows who His heirs are. And I am thankful that He has some spiritual agents on beck and call to minister to us. By the way, He's later going to say in the book... Be careful to entertain strangers unaware because they might be angels. Unaware. You ever seen somebody and never seen that individual again? And it was just for that specific purpose, whether it was a kind word spoke to them, whether, whether it was you buying them some food, give them a glass of water. God recorded that day. You're not going to lose that. Careful to entertain strangers because it could be angels unaware. My question to you is do you know this Jesus? Do you know him and his power and his person, his power and position? And if not, would you come to know him today? Let's stand to our feet in a moment of silence.